Welcome to the Women Inspired Podcast, brought to you by CareerKindling.com, a growing movement to help inspire, empower, and ignite women in their careers and in their lives. I'm your host, April Seifert. Each week, I get to interview some of the most inspiring women, and I'm bringing those interviews to you. Let's get to it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's podcast. I am so excited to bring to you an incredibly inspiring woman today. She is a professional in the apparel industry. She's a survivor of an aviation disaster and of cancer, and she describes herself as a passionate apprentice in the adventure called life. I'm not sure it gets any better than that. So I'd love to welcome Laura Zick to the podcast. Hi, April. It's great to be here with you. So, you know, I gave a little bit of an intro. We talked a little bit about some of the high-level bullet points, but tell us a little bit more about yourself so we can get to know you. I was born and raised in a rural farm community in um, Minnesota. I attended NDSU in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, go Bison! Woohoo! Um, <laughs> initially, I focused my studies on business and English. But then, uh, after a couple of years of getting into the college career, I adjusted my path and decided that apparel and textiles was really what I was more passionate about. Once I was, you know, getting towards graduating and trying to decide what I wanted to do with my life, I really felt like it was, uh, you know, I wanted to focus more on a corporate career in the apparel industry. I was able to uh, get an internship at a retail corporate office, which was local in the area. Um, I worked at the flagship store and in the buying department at the corporate office. And then at the end of the summer, I was lucky enough to be offered the assistant bottoms buyer position. Over the next eight and a half years, I stayed with the company and I was promoted to buyer. Had the opportunity to launch a private label denim brand. Nice. Um, I managed the product development and design of the brand, um, which was great because a lot of times if you work in a larger corporation, you may only be, um, you know, have the experience of being an assistant buyer and you don't have that product experience. Right. And what I found out was even though I, you know, thought I wanted to be a buyer all of my career, I was really more passionate about the product piece of it and seeing my designs come to life and seeing them sell and, you know, ultimately, while I was there, um, that portion of the business, the, um, that development piece of it grew to be uh, 75% of the company's assortment. Yeah, it was very exciting. And I really learned to enjoy that piece of it and work with, you know, international resources and vendors and working with wash techniques and, and you know, technical details and how a gene fits. And, and, you know, hearing the positive feedback of customers and, and um, you know, the excitement from them when they could find a gene that actually fit them. If they were, you know, six foot plus tall or, <laughs> you know, shorter or, you know, those hard to find sizes. So it was very rewarding. That's amazing. I guarantee there's way more that goes into the pair of jeans that I'm wearing right now than I would ever imagine. What are you up to these days? Well, um, I am actually just coming off of um, the next step on my um, career path um, this past, this August, um, I made the decision to relocate to New York. You know, I tend to be a little bit more of a, I'm definitely independent, but I also am a bit of a type A personality. I breached outside of my comfort zone, took a, a career sabbatical, and really just catching my breath over the next few months and taking the opportunity to explore the next steps in my career path. I'm finding that I'm really enjoying that, um, a little bit of downtime and really refocusing and reevaluating and taking that time to um, really make a decision on where I want to be and move forward and not feeling like I'm forced to take, you know, the next step or, you know, the next job that comes my way. I think that's so important. I think it's so important for people at certain points in time in your career to take the time that it takes to really evaluate and make a, you know, make a really intentional next step versus exactly what you said, feeling obligated to take the first thing that comes your way. It's interesting that you landed in New York or that you've moved to New York because 
I alluded to it a little bit as I introduced you, but New York is really the location of a very unique experience that you have gone through. Uh, For those of you who are listening, Laura was actually one of the passengers on flight 1549, the flight that has been called the Miracle on the Hudson. We've all heard countless stories about that day. Some people have maybe read the book that has been out. Some people have maybe seen the movie that recently came out. We've heard a lot of stories, but I'm really interested in hearing your story about that day. So take us back to that day and just tell us about that experience. The day was January 15th, 2009. I will never, ever forget it. Um, It was actually one month after I had, well, about a month and a half after I had moved uh, to Charlotte. So it was a unique experience in that I was starting something very new. I spent, you know, December relocating. I uh, actually didn't even move any of my personal belongings. Um, When I first started with the company, I went directly overseas and spent a couple of weeks over there uh, working on some product sourcing, came back for the holidays to visit my family in Minnesota, um, packed up my personal belongings, Um, the moving truck brought them into storage in Charlotte, and I was living in corporate housing, temporary housing, drove my car from Minnesota to Charlotte. And then um, a couple of days later, I was in New York on a business trip. I really didn't know many of the coworkers that I was traveling with. Um, So it was kind of, you know, like I was, you know, alone in the city in a, you know, with a whole new team. And And New York on that particular trip felt very glum to me. So I remember that day, it was very, very dark and gloomy and it just felt like something was hanging over the city so you know I went about my my appointments for the day uh, you know worked with some of my new co-workers ran into some people that I had known at other companies um, vendors that I had known for a while had dinner with vendors and it was like any other trip that you experience for business we were um, approximately a minute and a half into the flight when um, we experienced the bird strike. Um, it was just a large boom that caught everybody off guard. I happened to be reading a magazine and I gasped. And then I was embarrassed because I didn't, like, I'm not afraid of, of flying. I would never was afraid of flying. And it just, you know, it just happened. And it was just like this involuntary, you know, sound that came out of my mouth. Right. I looked around to see if anybody had noticed. There were, you know, other people had screamed or obviously something had happened. And, and other people were aware of it. There were people that were, you know, looking around the cabin. Not long after that, I smelled um, almost, you know, a burning smell. Oh, wow. um, which happened to be the um, geese that were, you know, ingested into the engines. And ultimately, they had caused, a, you know, a double engine failure. Um, the right engine, um, well, both of the engines were not functioning at that point. Um, but from where I was seated in 17D, I, when I looked across the aisle, um, I could see a warm glow of the left engine um, being on fire and flames shooting out um, from it. So um, it was definitely a very surreal experience. A couple minutes earlier, I was actually napping on the tarmac at LaGuardia because our flight was delayed um, and we were, you know, sitting in the queue waiting to take off. Um, So, you know, going from (laughs) a nice little nap on the tarmac and then I just opened up my magazine, started reading that and then, um, you know, getting to that point. And, and actually my first instinct after I gasped was to just put my head down and just keep reading the magazine. I'm like, I just pretend like I didn't do that. Nothing yeah. happened. But then, you know, I could hear kind of a little bit of, you know, stirring in the, in the cabin and it was a very bizarre. Um, it was, calm because there was no sound of the engine so it oh, was wow. very um it was just a very 
it was almost calming until I saw the the fire, you know, coming out of the engine. Um, but very bizarre having that, you know, experience of gliding over Manhattan. Um, and at first I was like, oh, no, we'll, we'll be okay. We're going to turn around. We're going to go back to LaGuardia. But, you know, once I saw, you know, the flames, I thought, okay, you know, that adds another element to it. Mm-hmm. I guess, you know, the engines were, you know, gliding. We banked left. Uh, which was, uh, you know, the captain trying to turn back towards LaGuardia. But, you know, at that time, they were in the cockpit, they were working through all of the protocol to be able to determine the best scenario, uh, trying to, you know, do all the ditching maneuvers so that they could sail off the plane. Um, um, They were in contact with the um, air traffic controller, um, Patrick, and trying to find the best route for us. Um, and one of the, you know, the most populated cities in, in the world. So um, we had no idea what was going on. It felt somewhat calm. We knew that there was something going on. But, um, you know, the moment that Sully said, you know, brace for impact, or he said, this is your captain, brace for impact, it was something that totally changed the dynamic of the situation and the word impact really resonated with me right. because it you know became something that was like okay uh when you land at LaGuardia airport there isn't impact involved um it's a landing so um you know that really changed it and it really you know changed the course of you know my thoughts and and how I reacted to it and I you know went through all these scenarios in my head how am I going to brace I'm fairly tall I had tall boots on I had you know I couldn't get my head down with the seat in front of me you know how you know seats are definitely not spacious on airplanes these days so I was going through all these scenarios of like you know should I swing my legs out into the to the aisle and maybe I can you know brace that way oh my gosh seatbelts on all of you know going through all this and I had no idea where we were um, because I was an, on an aisle seat at a certain point, people were counting down, you know, 10, 9, 8, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have no idea where we are, you know, what's going on. And it's a very difficult situation to be in when you're, all you know is that you're supposed to brace for impact, but you have no idea what you're bracing for. So, I can't imagine um, how, you know, I just want to pause for one second and just ask people who are listening to think about how you might have felt in that moment. I mean, I know that when when you just said those words, I had this unanticipated sort of emotional reaction to it. And I can't imagine how magnified that must have been if you were actually in that position. And it's just, it's just unbelievable. I mean, it was certainly surreal to hear that. But what was very empowering to me was just how amazing your mind and your body are in those experiences and how they basically take over. You know, it wasn't this whole, you know, sense of panic. It was more like, okay, this is out of my control. I cannot, you know, I cannot do anything in this scenario. All I can do is think through, make peace with the situation, brace, um, and know that whatever happens is ultimately, like, I can't do anything about it. So it doesn't do any good for me to panic. And it's really interesting how your mind goes through those steps. And it was very, it was very clear. It wasn't like the sense of jumbled thoughts in my head. It was very succinct. And it was one thought, here's what I'm going to do. And then here's what I'm going to do after that. And, um, you know, by that point, we had hit the water and it was a very jarring experience. It was like a basically like the harshest car accident you, that you could ever imagine. I mean, it was, it was an insane impact, but the body also kind of masked that. So I would never ever, you know, it didn't feel that way at that time. Now, the next day I could barely walk and it certainly felt like I was hit by a train. <laughs> but um, during that time, it was just, you know, the adrenaline kicks in. And it was, okay, we have just landed somewhere. I have no idea where we've landed. 
And now I see that, you know, it feels like there's water coming in from somewhere. And there was a moment when we landed and um, there was almost like this mist in the air and this ray of, of sunshine on this gloomy day came through the window. And it was this feeling, and I know that, you know, many, if not all of the passengers that I've spoken to um, felt that we were like, are we, is this it? Are we alive? Is, oh, wow. Is this what it's, you know, is this what it's like when you pass? So um, it took a second before we realized that we were actually still alive. Like, you really wanted to pinch yourself. Oh, and my gosh. It was okay, I think I am. I'm still here. So everybody just jumped up. You're like, let's get out of here. We've got to get out of this scenario. So, you know, there's, you can only evacuate a plane so fast, but it was definitely one of the quicker um, deplanings that I've experienced. Um, I still did not know, um, even though the water was coming in, um, I, it was up to my boots. I had tall boots on. It was up to my boots by the time I was able to stand up and to um, move down the aisle. Um, and I did not know that we were in the Hudson River until I got to the emergency exit on the left side and looked out and saw Manhattan. So at that point, there were two options, the wing or the water. And it was... Uh, 30, I believe 34 degrees that day. January um, in New York. Yeah, it was January in New York. I had a dress on, tights and boots, um, and I had my coat in my hand. So, um, and I had forgotten to bring the life preserver from underneath the seat. Because, oh. Um, I had no idea where we were, and I didn't know that we needed it. I thought maybe right. we were on land, and at first I thought maybe some of the water coming up from the back was maybe part of the toilet. <laughs> so I had, I had no idea. I was like, oh, my goodness. Okay, I have two options. And, you know, the people behind you were definitely very interested in, in you know, disembarking the plane, too. So. You know, we had to, you know, move fast. So I was like, okay, uh, I think I'm going to go with the wing at this point. Uh, you know, everybody was trying to file out onto the wing, but some people had opted for the water because we were on fire, um, you know, moments earlier and we were leaking jet fuel and there were all of these scenarios and we were on a plane that obviously was taking on water and would eventually sink. Um, and we had no idea if anyone was going to come to rescue us. But, um, yeah, I opted for the wing, which um, in January is um, iced over and slippery. And it's also, you know, curved. It was hard for everybody to stay on. People were slipping and sliding. Um, I was on the left side, the left wing. Um, the people on the right side, since the engine was seared off, they were actually below the water um, standing on the wing. And some of them were up to their chest in water. Oh, um, my God people in the back of the plane by the time they were able to deplane, they were almost up to their neck in water. Um, so depending on where you were on situated on the plane, it was a completely different scenario for everybody. You know, and that really impacted how people, you know, healed afterwards and and um, you know, the whole the whole rescue process and everything too. Um, I watched the whole rescue um and was one of the last passengers that was rescued from the plane. Um, we eventually were able to um, inflate the um, emergency slide on the left side, which we used as a raft, but it was very difficult. You know, it was getting twisted up and it was getting hung up on the plane and, and the wings were getting, you know, overcrowded and people were sliding off. And, and um, it was a very precarious situation um, when the slide laid down in the water, then, you know, several of us jumped over um, and pulled ourselves up onto the slide and um, were, we able, were able to relieve some of the um, congestion on the wing so other people could, you know, get out of the plane and, you know, evacuate. Eventually, you know, some of the rescuers and other passengers were throwing um, preservers out to us on the slides on the wings and uh, it was as I said very precarious 
um, there were, you know, the the police divers that came in from the helicopters and they were rescuing people in the water and the ferry boats were coming in. And, um, you know, this all happened within, you know, a matter of minutes um, after, you know, we crash landed. And it was watching everybody and, you know, trying to see people who were frozen in their hands when it moved, trying to, you know, get up, you know, ladders or, you know, these ferries that were seven feet, you know, high and trying to get, you know, into the, the ferry boats and, you know, say, okay, everybody's getting rescued and, and I feel like I'm going to be safe. And, and then uh, the ferry boats all dispersed and, and one came back and tried to throw us a uh, rope. We were actually tethered to the plane and had no way of cutting ourselves off. And, oh, my God. And um, within 24 minutes, the plane was was already, you know, completely underwater inside of the cabin, and the tail was sinking, and we were still tethered to the plane. Um, so we were sitting there thinking, okay. Just <laughs> when you thought it was going to be okay, and then so that starts happening. Yes, and then, we, you know, we decided the rope wasn't the way to go because they would have just pulled us into the water um, without our, our nice little slide. So we eventually were rescued by a Coast Guard boat, um, uh, but not without having an engine failure on the first um, Coast Guard boat that was dispatched. So it was, yes, I've survived. I've made it through. I've landed in the river. I'm on the slide. It's great. Someone's going to rescue me. And then... Uh, Oh, there's another engine failure, and then finally um, they dispatched another boat, and we were loaded onto that, brought up to the pier. Um, I was thrown in an ambulance and brought to the hospital, but it was like, yes, we're okay. No, we're not okay. Yes, we are. And I just remember this when I was brought to the pier, and there were two police officers on one on each side of me, and they were basically, you know, holding me up um, because this was, you know, several minutes. After we had landed and, and uh, you know, there's lots of adrenaline that's, you know, keeping you going. But um, once I reached the street, it was almost like my body just kind of was like, okay. I'm, I'm done, done now. I've done it all for you. My legs collapsed. My knees, you know, kind of buckled. And I was like, oh, I think I'm finally okay. And I just, you know, they just put me in the ambulance and I was like, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I was kind of joking. I'm like, I'm used to this. I lived in North Dakota for 12 years. <laughs> like, I'm used to this cold. <laughs> and I was, you know, joking with them. They're like, how are you alive? I'm like, I'm fine. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, oh, my gosh. I can honestly say I, I did watch the movie and I've you know, read stories of people's, some interviews that you've done, and it is a completely different situation having you talk through that day from your perspective. That's just, that's just incredible. Yeah. And it's so interesting. I mean, every single passenger has a completely different, you know, experience with that day where they were in their life and where, you know, they were that day and, and just the, the, not only the temperature climate, but the, the financial climate of the city and just, you know, what that really meant to everybody at that time and how many, you know, worlds were impacted by that, that, how, you know, that outcome and, you know, why they coined it the miracle on the Hudson. I mean, I will always certainly be, you know, grateful for, you know, our flight crew and our rescuers and, and just, you know, the timing. I mean, it couldn't have been more perfect. I mean, a few more minutes and, and, you know, people may not have survived. And in a different city, we may not have been that close to rescuers. And, um, you know, it would have been a totally different outcome. And I definitely think about that all the time. I have a definite appreciation for, you know, how it happened. That's amazing. So what I have often thought about is, well, I guess one point that I want to make is up until this point, you're a very normal person, right? Not that you're abnormal having gone through that, but really you have gone through this incredible experience, but you know, you, you had a career and you were, you were living your life and things were all very, very normal. And then this this set of circumstances happen to you. And I just think that is 
it's just really interesting to think about as we all move along our normal lives day to day, you just don't know. So one question I have for you is, I can imagine, or I can only guess that your relationship with fear is, has probably changed a bit. I can imagine that that morning or that day, you know, when you got on the plane, you had a very different relationship with it than you did immediately after the situation happening. And then potentially that has evolved over time. So can you talk about that just a little bit? I guess a lot of people, am I afraid to fly now? And I, I'm not, I guess. Um, I understand. I mean, there certainly are statistics that say that, um, you know, flying is one of the safest modes of transportation. Um, I don't want to, you know, say, I don't want to jinx anything, but, you know, the chances of, of something like that happening again are very slim. And I am certainly more afraid of missing out on all that life has to offer not spending enough time with my loved ones, um, not experiencing all of the uh, adventures that I desire, that it wouldn't be beneficial for me to to not travel. I mean, that's what I love to do. Um, and I want to take advantage of all of those things. I want to get the most out of life. Certainly are things that that I may have been afraid of before I um, before the incident um, that maybe just, um, you know, that I've come to peace with and that maybe I'm not afraid of now. Um, as I mentioned, um, after Captain Sully said, you know, this is your captain, brace for impact, after he made that announcement, um, it was an absolute reality check. Everything that was about to happen in those upcoming minutes was out of my control. So I had to make peace with it to make peace with the idea that we were, you know, as I mentioned, over one of the highest populated, densest cities in the world, and that impact possibly meant that we may not survive. So, you know, as I sat in my seat with the thoughts as I was bracing, realizing that the successes in my career ultimately meant nothing at that moment, and that the thought of having you know, another opportunity to see my loved ones meant everything. Um, I really made peace with the fact that I may die. And with that, I conquered that fear that day, the unknown fear of death and, and what it feels like. Um, and I'll certainly never forget those thoughts. Um, I reflect back on them very often. I remind myself, you know, to really focus on the priorities and what it felt like, like what exactly meant the most to me at that time when I thought that that was, you know, my last shot. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a great reminder to not get caught up in the day to day and, you know, some of those things that, you know, feel like they're not really trivial, but in the grand scheme of things, they are. It's such a it's such a huge lesson, and I think it's so so easy to feel like whatever challenges we're going through at the present moment are the 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 biggest deal, and that they are truly important. But when you put them in the context of something like this happening, they really don't seem important at all. No, no, not at all. Um, and I've definitely been able to take that forward in my life. Um, and you know, sometimes when I'm faced with a challenging situation or um, I feel myself, you know, feel a little anxious or you know, something taking over. I I know that people say it all the time. I breathe. I just take a breath and just step back, try to clear my head and just, I think about how clear my thoughts were that day and try to organize my thoughts in a meaningful way when it's not in, in a panic, life or death kind of a situation, you know, your mind isn't necessarily going into, you know, autopilot for you. So you have to, you know, do that for yourself. You know, I recognize that that life doesn't always take that um, ideal rest, but understand that flexibility can, you know, sometimes be the solution and, and the best way to minimize fear and understanding that a different way isn't always the wrong way. It's just a different path. 
it sounds like you've had a bit of a perspective change just in, you know, life and how you, how you approach it. Life after, you know, 1549, um, it didn't resume as normal. There was, as you know, many of us called it a new normal. There was definitely the aftermath. You know, I was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, there were a lot of things on how to, um, you know, really, really understand what happened and to be able to, to really clarify the magnitude of the situation and to find a reason of why, um, you know, I had survivor's guilt. I um, was like, why did we all survive? Why, why do we survive? And why do some other um, planes, you know, why do they crash and nobody survives? There was a lot of questioning and, you know, reflecting going on. You know, it wasn't like, you know, everybody walked away and everything went back to normal. I dealt with that for, you know, several years. I was diagnosed with um, some chronic muscular issues. And, um, you know, even had, you know, there were other traumatic incidents in, you know, my life that I had to deal with, too. So it was being able to, you know, I wasn't dwelling on that. And and what happened, it was how I could make sense of it all, take the best from it, and then move on and take that um, experience and use that to be able to manage the other things that came up in my life. But um, life certainly is filled with adversity. I I think back and I think, you know, there are things that are out of my control. And sometimes the best way to address it is to take one step at a time, to reroute, reprioritize, and move forward with that different path. Post-1549, I carry a feeling that uh, no matter what happens, I feel like I'm stronger than that situation and I'll always be okay. Having that feeling and that confidence and knowing that you can do it, no matter if you're like, oh, no, this is it. I'm, I'm going to lose it. I can't take <laughs> anymore. You know, you're like, okay, I just, you know, I just have to get through. I don't have to get through the week. I just have to get through this moment and take the next step, take a breath, figure it out. I just have to solve the next step before I get to those. And, um, you know, it's definitely a great reminder. You know, I certainly would never, ever wish a plane crash or a forced water landing on anybody. But um, to have, you know, to be able to make sense of that and to take, you know, those learnings with me through life has definitely been invaluable for me. That's incredible. It's a testament to exactly what you said, being present and in the moment and focusing on the one thing that you need to do right now in order to solve for the situation that you're in. It's something that I think a lot of us don't do very well. I know I don't. I know I start to focus on, you know, if I'm having a, if I'm having a tough day or if I'm, I'm working on a tough project at work or something difficult is happening at home, I'm thinking about, oh my gosh, how many times am I going to be in this situation that I'm going to need to to work through it and, and how many more times am I going to need to meet with these people or or deal with this this personal situation and really it it is it's it's a good lesson for us all to think about is no nope, we're not we're not in all those situations we're in this one right now and how do we go through this one right now Absolutely yes and it's very um applicable to you know the day-to-day life and business and your profession. Um, you know, there's many times where, you know, it's a, it's a different scenario, but, you know, maybe you're being challenged or somebody's, you know, challenging you to do something a different way. And you're like, no, no, this is how I planned it. This is, you know, how it's supposed to go. But to just kind of, you know, take a step back and say, okay, let me think about this. Let me come up with some scenarios and let me get back to you. Instead of saying, oh my goodness, now I'm just, you know, completely thrown, thrown for a loop, I have to redo all this. It's going to take hours, days. It not only calms yourself, but it um, gives the confidence. You're able to communicate that confidence to the people around you, and they don't feel that panic or feel like you don't have the situation under control. Absolutely. This has been fantastic. This has been inspiring to hear your story, completely inspiring to hear how you have 
you know, moved on from that experience, how it hasn't defined you, but it has helped you develop and helped you face other challenges that just come up day to day in our lives just as we move through this incredibly crazy journey. Before we let you go today, I do want to ask uh, one last question. We are compiling a Spotify power playlist. This is a playlist of inspiring and powerful songs that are being curated by the folks that are coming on this podcast and a few of them that I've thrown in myself as well. So uh, before we let you go today, I have to ask you, what is your favorite motivational song? I love music and I, there are so many situations that I feel like music has really been able to inspire me and to get me through. So um, I'm glad you asked. You know, it's, it's kind of corny, but um, it's a pop song um, by One Republic um, called I Live. But a lot of the, the words in the song are really applicable. applicable. Um, it's talking about maximizing your days and, and um, being able to relax and, in, and, in, and enjoy your life. And, you know, when the sun goes down, that, you know, that you raise your cup. Um, and whether it's, you know, happiness or pain, um, it's basically just saying, you know, I, I want to do it all. Like just looking back and saying, I did it all. Um, I owned every second or the last, you know, sentence of the chorus is with every bo- broken bone, I swear I lived. So it's basically just saying that, you know, life isn't easy, but, um, it's worth it. And it's such an experience and, and you have to live it. That is perfect. I think that's a perfect, perfect song to cap off what was an incredibly inspiring story. I want to thank you for being willing to come on to the podcast, willing and open to share your story. It's a it's a really intensely personal thing that you've been through, especially talking about some of the, the ways that it changed you emotionally and the way that you have you know, really lived your life since then. So I can't thank you enough. And we so appreciate it. Absolutely. It was great to speak to you today, April. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Laura Zick as she recounted her miracle on the Hudson. To make the most of what you heard in her interview, head over to www.careerkindling.com and search for miracle to bring up Laura's show notes page. Here you'll find some key takeaways from today's interview, as well as some prompts to help you reflect on what you heard. While you're there, sign up to join our community and we'll give you immediate access to our Spotify Power playlist, including Laura's song, I Lived by One Republic. We'd also love to hear from you. Head over to iTunes and leave us a rating or a review. If you liked what you heard, hit the subscribe button. Until next time, have an inspired week. <laughs>